As we near the end of this series on rediscovering church, I'm going to invite you to turn in the Word of God to the Apostle Paul's first letter to the Thessalonian Christians, chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And in a few weeks, we will, Lord willing, be looking at the first half of this chapter as part of an Advent series on the second Advent of our Lord Jesus Christ. I have mentioned before that for years I have thought about preaching an Advent series on the second Advent. Advent is a season for not only looking back on the birth of the Savior in Bethlehem, but looking forward to his return in glory at the end of the age. And we will look at four texts in First and Second Thessalonians. But for today, we're going to look at a couple of verses in the latter half of this chapter uh, as it relates to rediscovering church. Some years ago, I was in the library looking for something else entirely when I noticed a title that caught my attention, uh, a book by Warren Bennis, who is a teacher, a professor of business, and an expert on leadership. The title that jumped out at me was Why Leaders Can't Lead. Why Leaders Can't Lead. Um, the author explores an unconscious conspiracy that makes leadership particularly difficult in our times. And one of the factors that he explores in that book is what he calls the anarchic instinct. The anarchic or anarchy instinct. A tendency, a default to resist authority. Leaders can't lead because followers won't follow. Uh, a pull in contemporary culture away from followership. Examples abound. Um, the law school student who sues his school because they wouldn't publish a paper that he wrote. Uh, a surgeon who will do, instead of the medically right thing, the legally safe thing. The financial analyst who said, we no longer have bear markets and bull markets, what we have is a pig market. The um, numerous caucuses, constituencies, and advocacy groups that leaders have to contend with and satisfy. The life of a college president now, the shelf life of a college president now, is four years, down from almost 10 years in the 1950s. And that's because, as Warren Bennis says, colleges have become almost impossible to lead. And this anarchic instinct has affected many churches as well. Um, even traditionally authoritarian churches, the Roman Catholic Church, for example, has many, many members who don't care what the Pope says. Many members who take offense when a bishop denies communion to a pro-abortion legislator. Who does he think he is, they say. He ought to mind his own business. And few Protestant churches practice church discipline anymore. We heard Pastor Drew address this issue last Sunday in the message. One of the reasons that Drew mentioned is that if uh, church's leaders believe that somebody needs to be held accountable, called to account, disciplined, the person can just go down the street and join another church. And, and never mind church discipline. Even in the ordinary life of many congregations, people are less likely to follow the lead of their leaders. The mood of our times is such. The posture of people toward authority is such. So different from that of the Bible that words like these from Scripture may sound quaint or even jarring. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. Obey? Submit? <laughs> you got to be kidding. That was obviously written for a different time and culture. And uh, because we live in this time and culture, we can't help but be somewhat affected by this 
posture toward authority, this anarchic instinct. And so today's message may be a little difficult for some of us to hear, but if the church is to be what God wants it to be, and do what God wants it to do, we've got to understand what he says in the Bible about followership. Now, a few weeks ago, I told you that my word processor did not like my word one anothering. They didn't like uh, followership either. I get the little red squiggly underline when I type in followership. But I want to suggest that if our church is in the years to come to be what God wants us to be, to do what God wants us to do, if we are all going to truly rediscover church, then part of that is going to be understanding what he says in the Bible about followership. So, Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 12 and 13. The Apostle Paul writes, Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. Respect those who work hard. Do you realize that your elders work hard for you? That they commit to at least two evenings a month, which uh, sometimes last late into the night. That they often have other meetings with other groups or individuals uh, every month. That they have to do hard thinking about the Bible and how it applies to the life of the congregation they make tough decisions, they pray for you, they are stretched to grow spiritually and set a good example, they make sacrifices, they work hard. And it is too bad that in the wider church, the money grubbers and the power trippers and the spiritual abusers have undermined the respect that people are supposed to have for leaders in the church. It is sad that Religious phonies have lowered respect for church leaders in general. It's too bad that what the soap opera lives of the um, royal family have done for the monarchy in Great Britain, the televangelists have done for the church. But you, God's people, God's church, are responsible to discern, elect, and endorse the right leaders who will work hard for you and for Christ and then respect them. Will they be perfect? No, of course not. Will you always agree with them? No, probably not. Will they sometimes let you down? Count on it. But, Paul says, honor them. Respect them. How? Well, at bare minimum, don't badmouth them. A church in Pennsylvania had a child and parent dedication service like we often have here. And after the service, the pastor overheard a conversation. A man went up to a young father and said, you brought your child to dedicate to the Lord today. I did that once too, but let me beg you not to do to your son what I did to mine. Because he grew up hearing me criticize the pastor and the elders all the time until finally he walked away from the church and walked away from God. And then with a sob, he said, I plead with you, don't criticize your church's leaders like I did and ruin your son like I ruined mine. Don't badmouth them. Uh, secondly, if you hear a bad report about a pastor or elder, uh, don't be quick to receive it. 1 Timothy 5.19 says, Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it's brought by two or three witnesses. Now that's not bad counsel for the way you would receive a bad report about anybody in the family of God. Don't be quick to listen to gossip. But why is it 
especially important when it comes to leaders in the church? Probably, I think Paul would agree, because leaders in particular become targets of the mean-spirited and the vindictive and those who think they know better how to lead. People who are angry or jealous may misrepresent or misquote or even outright lie about leaders. And the leaders are often in a position where they cannot or will not tell their side of the story. So when Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5 to respect the leaders of the church, I think he means at least don't speak ill of them, don't be quick to receive a bad report about them, and there's much more that would be involved in respect um, heed their teaching, follow their example, give them the benefit of the doubt, pray for them, speak well of them, speak well to them, encourage them now and then. And as an aside, let me just say, and I'm sure that my fellow pastors would uh, amen this, uh, we appreciate how many of you took time to write us notes, uh, emails, Facebook messages, or snail mail cards uh, over the last several weeks, just telling us that you appreciate us. Uh, there's no way we can get to every one of you and thank you for your thank yous. But it does mean a lot to be appreciated. And another, uh, by the way, if it seems odd that I am delivering this message when I am one of the leaders concerned, does it feel a little funny to hear me telling you you're supposed to respect me? and the other elders and pastors of the church, all I can say is, I too am a man under authority. And Paul writes to pastors, encourage and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Well, here in our text, he says, respect those who, the end of verse 12, admonish you. Nobody likes to be admonished. Nobody likes to have a hard word of rebuke spoken. And so an elder approaching an erring Christian with a needed rebuke may be told to mind his own business. And a lot of current advice to church leaders is if you want to build a big congregation, find out what people want and give them that which is really not a bad idea if you are in business, find out what the customer wants and, and meet that need. If the bottom line is profit, then by all means, find out what the consumer wants. But if the bottom line, as it is in the church, is the glory of God, then leaders are not free to just you know, see what people want and then deliver that. They're going to have to sometimes say and do hard things. But unfortunately, there is in many churches, not this one, I'm glad to say, but in many churches, a tacit understanding that people will give a leader the measure of respect due his office as long as he doesn't do too much to disturb their sub-Christian lifestyle. Somebody put it this way, churches would like to have a leader with the authority of Moses, but none of his prophetic fire. Hold them, Paul says, in high regard. Hold them in the highest regard. I like the story about the woman who found a talking frog. Frog said that he was a Baptist pastor that he'd been put under a curse, and that all it took was a Christian woman to kiss him and he'd be restored to his old self. She put him in her pocket and walked away, and he called out, aren't you going to kiss me? She said, you're worth more to me as a talking frog. Um, I suppose probably a lot of people feel that way. But Paul says, hold the church's leaders in the highest regard, in love. Notice that in the middle of... Verse 13, in love. Somebody said it better than I could paraphrase, so I'll just read it. Love is the divine glue that holds the elders and the congregation together through conflict and disagreement. No council of elders is perfect. 
all elders have problems, weaknesses, and faults, and each believer has a unique perspective on how elders should operate. As a result, even the best elders are inevitably accused of pride, wrong judgment, doing too much or too little, moving too slowly or too quickly, changing too much or not changing enough, being too harsh or too passive. But love suffers long, 1 Corinthians 13. Love unites, heals, and builds up the church. And love covers a multitude of sins, 1 Peter 4. Believers who love their shepherds will have greater understanding and tolerance for their shepherds' mistakes. In love, believers will view difficult situations in the best possible light. In love, believers will be less critical and more responsive to the elders' instruction and admonition. The best thing a congregation can do for its elders is to love them. And only then will believers and elders be able to live in peace. That's Paul's hope. He ends verse 13, live in peace with each other. If congregation and elders love one another, give one another the benefit of the doubt, respect one another, it'll be possible to live in peace. A young rabbi was dismayed to find a quarrel among members of the congregation he'd been called to serve. During Friday services at one particular point in the service, Half of the congregation would remain seated, the other half would stand, and both sides would shout at each other to comply. Well, both sides insisted that their position was the tradition, and so seeking guidance, the young rabbi took a representative of both the stand-up party and the sit-down party to visit the founder of the synagogue, a 99-year-old rabbi who was in a nursing home. And um, the man from the stand-up side said, Rabbi, isn't it the tradition that at this point in the service we were to all stand up? The old man said, no, that was not the tradition. Well, said the other, the sitting-down representative, isn't it true then that at that point in the service we're all supposed to remain seated? And the old man said, no, that's not the tradition. And then the young rabbi said, well, rabbi, what are we supposed to do then? Uh, we have complete chaos. Half the people stand and shout while the other half sit and scream. And the old rabbi said, ah, that was the tradition. That was the tradition. Live in peace, Paul says. We'll never have peace We'll only have chaos if nobody is in a position of authority to say, let's stand or let's sit. Or let's meet at 9 o'clock and 10.30. Or let's only have so many special offering appeals in a calendar year. Somebody's got to make these decisions. And too many churches and have controversies and splits because people have no idea that they're supposed to submit to the church's leaders, which is what we read in Hebrews chapter 13. Briefly, we'll look at this verse and end with this. Hebrews 13, verse 17. Not only the Apostle Paul with the Thessalonian Christians, but the unnamed author of Hebrews writes in verse 17 of Hebrews chapter 13, Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. Huh. Obey them. Does that grant the leaders of the church unlimited authority? Does this imply that followers are supposed to give unquestioning submission? Well, to ask the question is to answer it. No, of course not. Only God is entitled to unquestioned, absolute obedience. But I think that the writer of Hebrews and the Apostle Paul would say that 
the church member's default should be submission to leadership. Now, all of us have computers now, and so we all know something about what the word default means. You have certain defaults built into your word processor, for example. Unless you tell the computer to do otherwise, it'll give you single space, it'll print all the pages of a document, it'll use a certain kind of font, and you can overrule that default. You can ask for double space, you can ask for comic sans, you can ask it to just print one page, but unless you overrule it, the default is going to be in operation. And the members of a congregation ought to have a default, a bias toward following the lead of those who are in leadership. So here's an example. The Board of Elders proposes a rather significant restructuring of the church's Christian education program. And one member says, they didn't ask me my opinion. I'm voting against it. Another says, that's a lousy idea. We've never done that before. What makes them think that'll work? I'm voting against it. And a third says, boy, it seems to me like this plan is not really going to strengthen our congregational life or our attempts to dis disciple the next generation. I, I'm going to have to talk to the elders about it, and if necessary, vote against it. You see that the third is a conscientious follower, even if the person votes the same way as the other two who are just cranky Christians. Or another example is a pastor addresses a controversial subject from the pulpit, abortion or homosexuality, or the roles of men and women in the church and in the home, and three members disagree. One just doesn't like what she hears and makes her uncomfortable and she tunes out. Another asks, who does he think he is trying to tell me how to live my life and blows it off? A third says, I'm not completely convinced that the pastor has it right on this one. I know I'm not a perfect interpreter of the Bible, but my reading of Scripture, I, I, he might be off. I'm going to have to do some more hard thinking about this, and if pressed for my opinion today, I would say I think he's mistaken. You see, the third is a faithful follower, even if disagreeing with the leader, even though the, and the first two are not. Or another example of a different kind, this is a true story, a church in Colorado had a um, dirt parking lot next to their small church building, and whenever it rained or snowed, the parking lot just turned into a, a mud pit. And so the church was considering uh, spending money for the purchase of gravel. Now, since it was a Baptist church, that meant all these kinds of decisions were made by the congregation. And for some reason that nobody can seem to remember, this turned out to be a controversial one. I guess there were some people who thought the money should be spent on something different. And so the debate went back and forth, the vote was taken, and by a split vote they agreed to spread gravel on the muddy parking lot. Farmers would haul the gravel, volunteers would come and spread it, and after the meeting, a woman came up to the pastor and said, you know, pastor, I voted against this proposal, but I'll be there Saturday morning to help spread the gravel. Now there's somebody with a default a followership. You don't have to agree with everything, but at the end of the day, somebody has to make the decision. And it's interesting that in Hebrews 13, 17, this recommending of a default posture of submission to church's leaders has this concluding line about what would happen if the church's leaders couldn't lead because people wouldn't follow. That would be of no advantage to you. That would be of no advantage to you. This is a figure of speech that's kind of the opposite of hyperbole. It's when a mild negative is used in place of a strong positive. We do this all the time in ordinary speech. We might not say, great job. We might say, not a bad job. 
or of a meal that is particularly delicious, we might not say, man, was that good. We might say, man, that was not gross. Um, <laughs> understatement to make the point. So the author here, when he says, that would be of no advantage to you, is saying, if the church's leaders are unable to lead because the people of the church will not follow, this is going to be bad for you even disastrous. Qualified men and women will not step forward to lead when the congregation is perpetually obstinate. Fellowship in the family gets sour when the atmosphere is poisoned by backbiting and criticism. Counselees stumble from one pain to the next when they will refuse to heed godly counsel. Admonished sinners will sear their consciences when they won't receive a life-giving rebuke. Good ideas will never get off the ground when met by the resistance of a few stubborn naysayers. Congregations will stagnate when leaders can't lead because followers won't follow. The story can't be true, but it is funny. I think, anyway, the commencement speaker at Yale University was challenging the graduates to be leaders. Isn't this what commencement speeches are all about? Be leaders. And he outlined his commencement address with an acrostic based on the name of the university, Yale. He spoke for 20 minutes on the Y for youth, 30 minutes on the A for ambition, 15 minutes on the L for loyalty, another 20 minutes on the E for enthusiasm. And at the end of this 85-minute speech, one of the graduates was overheard saying, it's a good thing this isn't the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. <laughs> um, long graduation speeches on leadership are common, but how can every alumnus be a leader? Doesn't somebody have to follow? A few commencement addresses challenged the graduating seniors to followership and perhaps a few sermons. Maybe you've never heard one before today. Well, I pray that the Holy Spirit will use this look at two texts in the New Testament not only to make a difference in the way we think about the church and what we do with this truth, because if we're going to be what God wants us to be and do what God wants us to do, we all have to understand and believe and put into practice what he says about followership. And I know it's the kind of motto that you might just see for sale in a store or website that specializes in these kind of motivational things, but I believe it's true. Keep it in mind as we transition to a new chapter of the church's life. And that search committee whose names you read about in the bulletin today, um, look for a new lead pastor. Great leaders are not born, they're made by great followers. Let's pray. Lord, seal this truth to our hearts, I pray. Let it make a difference in us as individuals and as a congregation. And I say that prayer even as I preach this sermon, not because I think there are glaring issues here at Christ Community Church. I praise you that for the 25 plus years that my family and I have been here, we have had remarkable, peaceful relationship among staff and elders and between staff and elders and the congregation and pray that it might continue uh, for the glory of Christ and for the sake of his kingdom work here and around the world. But we don't take it for granted because we know the church has a great enemy. and We know that we ourselves are all too prone to weakness and failure. And so I ask that you'll help us to live the vision of the church that we've read about in your word today. In Jesus' name, and let all his people say, Amen. Stand, would you, for this concluding word from the... Apostle Paul, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, 
To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, now and throughout all generations. Amen.